Hello, my name is Angie Anderson and I'll be your host for this lecture series for Western Civilization 102 since the year 1500. We go, uh, we continue on from our Western Civilization 101 lecture series. Uh, you will hear from different faculty members in the History and Political Science Department here at Southeastern Louisiana University as they lecture on different topics concerning this second half of Western Civilization. Uh, for students, please check your syllabus um, for any information on this course and be sure you know how to contact your instructor. Western Civilization 102 will consist of four units. The first unit, which we will begin today, deals with and covers the Renaissance or the rebirth mainly focused in Italy, and Reformation. The a second unit that will eventually um, be covered, Absolutism and the Enlightenment. We'll get into that as we go. Unit three, Revolutions and Nationalism. And unit four for this uh, lecture series, Western Civilization 102, will be uh, Modern Europe. Now, Dr. Bill Robison will start us off with our very first lecture uh, for this series of lectures in Unit 1. He is the Department Head for History and Political Science at Southeastern Louisiana University. And he begins our first lecture entitled, The Medieval Church and Society. This is around the 14th, 15th centuries. First, Dr. Robison will take you through a brief history about what happens before we begin this unit. It's always very helpful when we start a new um, series for you to understand what came before it. It makes it so much easier to understand what's actually happening um, with this uh, medieval church and society to see what we've come from. So he will cover that in this uh, first lecture. For example, he'll talk a little bit about um, Unit one, uh, Western Civilization 101, um, uh, specifically more about the Middle Ages, especially the later Middle Ages when we had such a very rough time in society with the 14th century with the Black Death and the plagues and the warfare and the rebellions and the church splitting, and splitting up and and uh, corruption, it was just not a good time. So he talks about that, so that in order for us to understand um, how far we're starting to come, we're, we're turning around, we're turning that 14th century around here, coming into Western Civilization 102. He will discuss what the medieval church was like during this time period, how was it structured, the different class of people, um, the nobility, the bourgeoisie, or the bourgeois, kind of like the middle class. He'll also discuss the lower classes. Um, he will discuss the sacraments of the, the church. And when I say the church, I mean the Catholic church. Um, that's what we're discussing right now. In addition, Dr. Robison discusses what it was like to receive an education at this time. Um, Definitely different than what it's like today, I can tell you for sure. Um, let's see. Dr. Robison also um, discusses the fact that because we had to uh, endure, well, we didn't, but people had to endure this very bad 14th century during the later Middle Ages, how that will help make this reform and these reform movements with uh, the medieval church and society. Um, people are going to try to make things better. There will be a lot of people, some like Martin Luther during the Reformation, which you'll eventually hear about, who will go against the church. They will say, we don't agree with everything the Catholic Church says, and they will start doing these Protestant reformations which wasn't always well received with the church, mind you. Um, but either way, between the, um, the Renaissance, which came about after the later Middle Ages, 
this rebirth of civilization, rebirth, um, recovery. That's another word for it. It's a good word for it. Recovery from that very bad 14th century, very calamitous times. Um, we get this renaissance. And you'll find out that it's centered in Italy. And there are numerous reasons why the Renaissance will be centered in Italy. Uh, one being the fact that people will look to the past, especially the Greeks um, and the Romans, when they're, they're looking at um, society here in the Renaissance. And what better place than Italy with all of their ruins? It was the perfect spot for this Renaissance, this recovery, this rebirth that was experienced. Not to mention the fact that the aristocracy or the nobility in Italy, they would um, support artists and writers. They were patrons. They would support these people, give them food, give them lodging so that they could create, I don't know, the Mona Lisa or the Sistine Chapel, okay? That we will, obviously that's a very famous part. There's much more to it than that. But Italy will be the center of this coming out of the later Middle Ages, um, coming into our topic for Western Civilization 101. Eventually, this spreads into Northern Europe, um, and we will, of course, find that out as we go through this lecture series. So let's find out about, um, more about this fascinating subject from Dr. Robison. I'd like to begin today by asking why we study Western Civilization. There are perhaps a million reasons that I could give you, but perhaps the most important is that Western civilization is our civilization. If you look at the United States Capitol, one of the most striking features is the dome on top. You can trace that architectural feature back to the Enlightenment, from there to the Renaissance, thence to the Romans, and all the way back to the Etruscans. If you look at the Greek columns on the front, they are by definition Greek, which means that you can follow the same path to them. But perhaps even more important is what goes on inside this building for the ideals of republicanism and democracy which we hold so dear can also be traced back to much earlier phases in western civilization i'd like to give you just a brief thumbnail sketch of the period prior to 1500 uh, which uh, would be covered in history 101 normally if you look at the ancient near east we draw a great deal more from there than most people realize in Mesopotamia, civilization first came into existence. The first governments, the first system of writing, the first organized religion, the first monumental architecture. If we move over to Egypt, on the other end of the Fertile Crescent, we find great achievements in engineering, the world's first social calendar, and a society based on the concept that the universe is a just universe. If we then move to the Hittites, who still have yet to yield up many of their secrets from Asia Minor, uh, we know for certain that they were the first people to introduce iron-making technology, which remains important even today. The Phoenicians, the Assyrians, and the Chaldeans are all remembered primarily for their cruelty in some ways, yet they too gave us great cultural bequests. The Phoenicians, the alphabet. The Assyrians gave us the first great library. The Chaldeans invented the weak and bequeathed to us a great deal of knowledge about astronomy. The Persians created the largest empire of uh, history up until their own time and developed ways of organizing it using roads and subdivisions of government and what have you that the Romans later employed and that we still find in modern states today. And of course the Hebrews gave us the first lasting monotheistic religion and the Old Testament of the Bible. If we turn to the Greeks, of course everyone knows at least a little Greek mythology. Uh, it, you could hardly find a modern movie or novel or what have you that does not in some way incorporate that. The Greeks were also the first people to consciously write history. They were the first people to consciously develop philosophy, and indeed Greek philosophy still influences the way we think today. Their art and literature are still a large part of what we do. And of course, all of the Greek culture was spread beyond Greece to much of the known world at the time by the conquests of Alexander the Great. The Romans gave us the idea of civic virtue, the idea of a long-lasting republic, 
They gave us a more organized structure of law. They too passed on their mythology, their art, their literature, and their philosophy. And they too created a vast empire so that all that was part of Roman civilization was spread to much of the rest of the world. It was also in ancient Rome that Christianity rose from being a tiny little religious sect in the Middle East to being the largest religion in the Western world. And toward the end of the Roman period, the third great monotheistic religion, Islam, came into existence in Arabia and in fact preserved much of the knowledge of the ancient world through the Middle Ages. What we used to call the Dark Ages now seems like a not so dark period. Uh, it witnessed, in Western Europe at least, a fusion of three elements. The culture of the classical world, the Greeks and the Romans informed by the cultures of the ancient Near East. Secondly, the culture of the Germanic tribes who inhabited Western Europe. And thirdly, Christianity. And by the 8th century, these three elements had fused together to produce what we now know as Western civilization. Also, the area that these kingdoms cover is sometimes referred to collectively as the res publica Christiana, or Western Christendom. That is to say, it was seen by the people who lived there as forming a single community. Although we nowadays think largely in terms of nation states, we think of ourselves first as Americans, for example, community in the Middle Ages either meant your local community, your village, or your town, or it meant the res publica Christiana, something to which everybody belonged. During the High Middle Ages, there was a revival of culture, there was a growth of towns, uh, an expansion of the economy to an international level, the develop, uh, development of feudal kingdoms, a long-lasting struggle between the Holy Roman Empire in Germany and the papacy, uh, which still reverberates down into the period that we'll be talking about in this class. And of course, this was the era of the Crusades. Coming to the later Middle Ages, I'd like to first show you a map here. This is what Europe looked like about 1400. And what you'll notice is that in the middle of that map, where Germany is now and where Italy is now, neither one can be found. Geographically, of course, the areas are still there, but what now, we nowadays know as Germany was part of a much larger, loosely affiliated construct known as the Holy Roman Empire, and Italy was divided up into a number of subsidiary states, all of which proved very important during the Renaissance and on into the Reformation. Uh, there is an identifiable kingdom of France and kingdom of England uh, in the West, Spain, uh, modern Spain at least, is just coming into existence. The Scandinavian kingdoms to the north are all one at this particular juncture, and Eastern Europe by and large looks very little like it looks today. Uh, Poland and Lithuania are, are in much different places on this map than you would find them now. Uh, Russia has not really come into existence, it's still the Duchy of Muscovy. Uh, Hungary is a separate state and down in the southeast, of course, you have the vast Ottoman Empire, which is becoming ever more vast during the period that we are discussing. During the 14th century uh, and 15th centuries, uh, the social ranks that exist in the period that we are going to be talking about in this unit had solidified pretty much. At the top of the social scale were emperors. There, were only in fact, uh, there was only, in fact, one emperor in the West, uh, at least in theory, kings were subsidiary to the emperors. Below them came the nobility. Below the nobility came the knights and the gentry. Below them was an emerging new middle class, sometimes referred to in the Middle Ages as the burghers. And still further below them, those individuals who were free peasants, that is, peasants who owned their own land and were free to labor as they pleased and still, in much of Europe, a substantial number of serfs. Monarchy became the dominant form of government in the later Middle Ages. Uh, empires were simply too big to manage effectively. City-states like those in Italy 
found it difficult to compete with the larger monarchs. Monarchy, of course, was based on the idea that God lay behind the authority of the king. We're not yet to the point of having what we call divine right absolutism, although that will show up in Unit 2, but certainly it was believed that God gave kings their power. And so when a king came to power, he was consecrated and he went through a process of coronation that symbolized both the approval of God and of the people. Uh, another thing about kingship to keep in mind in the period we're talking about is that it's very much oriented around dynastic goals. We tend to think today in terms of national goals, but the king of France was more concerned with what was good for his dynasty than he was for what was good for the nation of France. So this is an important factor here. If we turn to the nobility, we find that there are quite a few ranks here, and this is still an age which is extremely status conscious, very concerned about protocol, so where you stood in the social structure was immensely important. The highest rank of nobility was Archduke. We find these only in Eastern Europe. Elsewhere, the highest rank was Duke, followed by Marquis or Marquis, depending on where you were, uh, then by count, or if you were in England, the, the rank was earl, then viscount, and finally baron, a term that originally meant anybody who owned a castle, but which by the 14th and 15th centuries referred to the lower order of nobility. The middle class, which began to emerge in this period, owed its existence to the fact that wealth now was much more involved with capital than it had been in the past. Land had been the chief form of wealth, the chief form of status in the earlier Middle Ages, but capital in the form of cash, in the form of goods, and what have you, had made the middle class into a real power. The, the middle class was also in this period becoming a much more educated group of people, not least because they needed to understand the law, uh, since business frequently involved litigation, and also uh, so that they could understand things like bookkeeping. In fact, there is a revolution in accounting that takes place in this period that has a lot to do with the economic success of this period. And of course, uh, the middle class exercised a lot of power in their own urban localities, but as yet, they still had very little authority on the national level. Among the lower classes, you, you do have, as I mentioned earlier, a free peasantry. There are also still quite a lot of people who are still in serfdom. That is, uh, they're not legally property like slaves are, but they are bound to the land and their movements are restricted. Generally speaking, in Western Europe, serfdom was in decline. In Eastern Europe, serfdom still was being maintained and Muscovy or Russia provides the one exception to those two rules in that there, there had been a free peasantry in the Middle Ages that was being driven into serfdom at the time that we speak. I'd like to turn to the church now for a moment and talk a little bit about how the church is organized because the church is immensely important in this period. There, there is no such thing as separation of church and state in this era and political power and ecclesiastical power are often like this. Here too, we have a very structured hierarchy. This is the Middle Ages, so we're talking about one church in the Western world, the Roman Catholic Church, and at the head of that church is the Pope. Below the Pope, you have the archbishops who preside over very large archdioceses, then the bishops who provide over preside over smaller dioceses, the individual clergy in their local parishes, and finally the lay people, people like you and me, at the bottom of the structure. Now the people that we're talking about here, from pope down to clergymen, are what we call secular clergy. Not secular in the modern sense, but secular in the sense that their job was to deal with people in the regular world. There was, however, also a category of clergy known as the regular clergy, uh, so-called because they followed a rule, the Latin word for which is regular. Uh, this would include two main groups of people. There were those who lived as monastics, as monks or nuns, uh, who lived in monasteries, 
uh, who would be presided over by an abbot or a prior and who would do various kinds of work devoted to the church. A second group which emerged in the High Middle Ages and that will be very important in the early phases of our story here were the friars or mendicants, so called because they originally made their living uh, as beggars. Uh, the two primary groups are the Franciscans and the Dominicans. In both cases they would be supervised by the general of their order, but otherwise they did not live in monasteries. They traveled about preaching or serving as teachers. Now, a little bit about medieval theology here. Again, bear in mind that when we talk about community here, we're talking about the church being the overarching community. So what people believed is immensely important. Not everyone was equally well educated. Uh, your typical serf did not have the knowledge of theology that someone who had been to school had, and he would not have the knowledge of somebody who was a priest or a bishop. Nonetheless, the main points of theology that I want to outline for you here are what underlay the belief and practice of all Western Christians, save for a handful of heretics. Furthermore, all of these are ideas that are going to be challenged during the Renaissance and Reformation as an alternate form of Christianity, what we call Protestantism, emerges. The main areas that I want to talk about have to do First of all, with salvation, a fairly fundamental element of religion. Secondly, with revelation, that is, how we know what God wants. Thirdly, with authority. Fourth, with the sacraments. And finally, with the role of the clergy. Now, if we look at that first question, salvation, how one is saved, how one ends up in heaven rather than in eternal perdition, Traditional medieval theology said that two things are necessary. On the one hand, you had to have faith. That's pretty basic. On the other hand, you had to do good works. You had to live a good life. You had to go to church. You had to take the sacraments. You had to do various other things uh, that, that might serve as a penance for sins that you had committed. But the faith and the good works are of equal value. Both are essential. Later on, we'll see Protestantism challenge that. A second area has to do with the question of revelation. How do we know what God wants? How do we know what God says? Well, in the Middle Ages, there were three ways that one could discern God's will. The first of these, obviously, was Scripture, the Bible, the, New and, the Old and New Testaments. A second way was through the writings of the early church fathers, that is, those individuals who in the early history of the church had worked out basic doctrines, dealt with questions like the Trinity, for example, and left behind highly influential writings like, like for example, those of St. Augustine. The third way was through the church itself. It was believed that God continued to reveal His will through the official uh, dictates of the church, and in particular, when the Pope made pronouncements ex cathedra, that is, sitting on his formal papal throne. So, three ways, through Scripture, through the early church fathers, and through the continuing revelation of the church. Protestants will challenge this as well. A third concern was where does authority come from? To whom does God give authority? And how does that authority then get dispersed through society? In the Middle Ages, the dominant view was that God gives authority to the Pope, to the papacy. The Pope is often known as the Vicar of Christ, that is, the assistant of Christ, or as Christ's representative on earth, uh, is believed, according to the Petrine doctrine, to hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the power to bind and loose souls. Therefore, this is a theory that we might call a downward theory of authority, where God gives authority to the Pope and everyone below Him derives their authority from Him. So, authority descends from the Pope to the archbishops, then to the bishops, then to the clergy, and ultimately to the laity. Now, this is very much in keeping with a society where monarchy is the dominant form of government. 
the papacy is in fact a kind of church monarchy. But this too will be challenged with great political implications during the Renaissance and the Reformation. That next brings us to the question of the sacraments. There are seven official sacraments in the late medieval church. And it's interesting that these sacraments intersect with one's life at pretty much every important juncture. For example, the first thing we all do is to be born. And there is a sacrament immediately waiting for newborn infants, the sacrament of baptism. At about the age of six, about the age when we would start going to school now, one begins going to communion. And in order to go to communion, one must also go to confession, confess one's sins, do absolution for that. So, those are three sacraments right there, baptism, confession, and communion, all of which you would do while still a small child. Now, before I leave the subject of communion, I should mention that the accepted doctrine of communion in the later Middle Ages is what's called transubstantiation, what is still the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church today. This is the notion that during the communion ritual that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. That is, their appearance, their taste, their smell as bread and wine are what we call philosophical accidents. In essence, they are Christ's body and blood. Now, the next sacrament that comes along is the sacrament of confirmation, uh, one that in the later Middle Ages children went through when they reached the onset of adolescence. This confirmed your earlier baptism and sort of welcomed you uh, into a more adult practice of the faith. At the other end of adolescence, for most people, there waited the sacrament of marriage. The vast majority of people in the Middle Ages got married. There, there weren't a lot of swinging singles in the Middle Ages. But if you didn't get married, the primary reason that was likely to be the case is because you became a clergyman of some kind, because you became a priest, because you became a monk, because you became a nun, in which case you would go through a sacrament of ordination. Now, if you get married, pretty soon you have kids of your own and they start going through the sacraments of baptism and confession and communion and confirmation. If you become ordained, then obviously the church is a daily part of your life from then on. And then finally, at the end of life, uh, there are the last rites or what the medieval church called extreme unction. So the church is there with a sacrament at every point in your life. And since only the clergy can administer these sacraments, this makes them extremely important. And bear in mind, the clergy derive their authority from the bishops, who get it from the archbishops, who get it from the pope, who gets it from God. Therefore, that whole channel of authority, that whole channel bringing the sacraments to you is divinely ordained in the view of the later Middle Ages. And all of the sacraments are considered to be essential for salvation. Therefore, you can't afford not to participate in any of them. In addition to that, there are other ways that the church is a regular part of everyone's life. For example, we can look at the role of the calendar and the clock in the later Middle Ages. You might not necessarily think of either of those things in religious terms today, but they certainly were. The calendar used in the late Middle Ages was the Julian calendar, that is the calendar that Julius Caesar brought to the West from Egypt during his day. Uh, it's basically the same calendar that we have now, although it's been tweaked a little bit since then to make it more accurate. But 365 days a year, 12 months, and so on. The calendar, however, is extremely ecclesiastical in nature, very much oriented towards Christianity and the church. The entire year is divided up into what the church now calls the liturgical year, uh, where at all times one is observing something appropriate to the season, not just at Christmas and Easter, but at all times. Furthermore, not only is the calendar divided up into religious seasons, there are some 60 holy days, 
or holidays as we call them now. Uh, again, not just Christmas and Easter, but days associated with the saints, days associated with various actions of Christ or the Virgin Mary or the apostles or what have you. In fact, this is a great blessing for working people in the Middle Ages because these holy days were about the only time that they didn't have to work, the holy days and on Sunday. And at least in theory, on the holy days, your local Lord was supposed to provide food and drink for you. So the holiday was not only a religious observance, it was also an occasion for feasting and rejoicing. Uh, in addition to that, of course, one was expected to go to church every week, and that too introduces a religious regularity uh, to the lifestyle of people in the later Middle Ages. A uh, quirky thing about the calendar in use at this time is that the new year didn't start when it starts now. Uh, in much of Europe, the new year started not on January the 1st, but on March the 25th. Now, why March the 25th? Well, the reason for that is that if you orient the entire calendar around uh, Christianity, think about it like this. When do we celebrate the birth of Christ? December the 25th. Now, we don't actually know when He was born, but that is the traditional date for celebrating it. If you backtrack nine months, that gets you to March 25th, which would have been the time of Christ's conception, and that's when the year began. Uh, the other thing is that dating uh, in these calendars is not necessarily done the same way that we would do it. Uh, rather than writing December the 26th, uh, people would date documents by saying the day after Christmas. Now, that one's pretty easy for historians, but when you start getting to things like eight days after the Feast of St. Michael, that means that historians have to use lots of reference books to keep up with what day we're talking about. The church also played the primary role in learning in this period. Uh, the church was beginning to create uh, a certain number of what are called grammar schools uh, at this time because they quite literally taught Latin grammar, among other things. But the churches also ran the universities. The universities had emerged in the Middle Ages uh, as a kind of guild. Uh, there were guilds for merchants, there were guilds for craftsmen, there were guilds for religious purposes. The, the universities originated as guilds for people who wanted to study the law or medicine or theology. And what you did if you wanted to do that was to find somebody who was a master of that particular subject, which is where we get the, the term master's degree. And eventually what happened is that groups of students would hire groups of teachers to teach them. And ultimately, these settled down into uh, locations where they became permanent and settled and had buildings associated with them and officials associated with them. But they actually originated as voluntary associations of teachers and students. Uh, in order to study at the university, you had to take at least minor clerical vows and you had to wear clerical robes. That's why when you graduate from Southeastern or from anywhere, you wear that robe. That is a holdover from the old guild status of the university. Now, in the 14th century, things started off pretty well. That is, we're coming out of the high Middle Ages, a period of economic prosperity, a period when the population was growing, a period of reform and revival. But in the 14th century, uh, you might say that Murphy's Law intrudes. You know Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And certainly, that's the way the 14th century seems. In, in fact, there are, are so many things that go wrong in the 14th century that historians talk about a 14th century general crisis. That is a crisis that pervades pretty much everything. So, for example, there is a demographic crisis crisis, that is, a crisis affecting population. There is a military crisis, a widespread outbreak of particularly destructive war. There is economic crisis that comes along with that, social crisis that comes along with that, political crisis that comes along with that, and perhaps most significantly, a religious crisis, an ecclesiastical crisis that comes along with that. 
And the reason I'm focusing on this a bit is that this crisis has a tremendous impact on what happens in the next couple of centuries. It changes the way people think. It alters people's psychology. It makes them more pessimistic. It makes them question why so many things are going wrong. If you can think back to the psychological impact that 9-11, a single event, had on all of us, imagine a whole century of 9-11s and how that might affect popular psychology. Well, let's begin with the demographic crisis. First of all, the 14th century saw the beginning of what climate historians call the Little Ice Age. That is, the mean temperature of the Earth dropped. And it's only got to drop just a little bit to radically affect the growing season in Europe, especially in Northern Europe. Furthermore, one of the results of the Little Ice Age is that the climate gets wetter. There is more rain, and unfortunately that rain does not always fall at opportune times. So the growing season is shorter, it's colder, there is more damp than is really desirable. And one of the first results of that is that there is a famine that takes place in the late 13 teens. There is a series of poor harvests, there's not enough uh, food to go around, people end up eating their seed corn as well as that that was grown for food purposes, which means they plant less the next year, there's another bad harvest, and so on. And thousands and thousands of people died in this crisis. Uh, had nothing else happened of this nature in the 14th century, we would probably still regard this as a terrible thing and, and maybe as you know, the worst event of the 14th century. But in 1347, along came something which made the earlier demographic crisis seem mild by comparison. And that was the arrival in Europe of the Black Death, or technically bubonic plague and some of its cousins. Uh, the Black Death between 1347 and 1351 wiped out approximately one-third of the entire population of Europe. In some places it wiped out whole towns, whole villages, whole monasteries. Of course, it was worse in densely populated areas because it was spread by fleas who lived on rats who then passed it on to humans. Now, one frequently hears modern epidemics compared to the Black Death, but that's entirely disproportionate. Uh, nothing in modern times has done the sort of damage that the Black Death did in the mid-14th century. And again, this led people to become almost obsessed with death, uh, to, to believe that death was virtually inevitable, and to believe that God must be angry with His people for some reason. It also led to other problems. For example, uh, there is, along with this, a military crisis. Uh, this is the era of the Hundred Years' War. And in conjunction with the Black Death, if you happen to be in France or in England during this time and the plague didn't get you, there was a pretty good chance that the war would. And war, of course, creates dislocation, war creates unhealthy living conditions, and the two feed off of each other. There is also social crisis and economic crisis that comes out of the plague. For example, when we talk about a third of the population being wiped out, that's not done neatly, so to speak. It's not done so that, well, you still have two-thirds of the people producing and two-thirds of the people consuming in a nicely conjoined fashion. What in fact happens is that in some areas, entire agricultural communities are wiped out and there's nobody to produce food for the nearby towns. In other cases, you have towns wiped out and there's nobody to buy the food that's being produced by agricultural communities. Um, we talk frequently about economic problems, and of course our economic problems are perfectly real, but they are nothing compared to what the plague created in the 14th century. And of course along with that come social problems. One of the social problems actually comes with something that is good for the lower classes, that is to say, the peasantry, uh, who in many cases were still serfs before the plague, 
were able to demand and get freedom. If they, didn't, if they were free already, they were able to demand and get better wages, better working conditions, and so on. But very often what resulted is that the ruling classes pushed back against this. And the result of that sometimes was revolt. The 14th century, after the Black Death, is rife with social upheaval. Uh, the two most famous examples of this, perhaps, are the Jacquerie in France in 1357 and the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 in England, both of which were massive peasant uprisings, both of which ultimately failed, but which were extremely disruptive, and which, by the way, contributed to the psychological unease of this period. As, as far as most people were concerned, the social order, the economic order, were, were ordained by God. And therefore, rebellion, uh, like the peasants' revolts, was not just rebellion against the ruling class and the monarch, it was also rebellion against God. Peasants didn't necessarily see it that way, but again, it creates to, uh, or it contributes to that unease from the period. Now, if we found ourselves faced with this many disasters, God forbid, but if we did, uh, we would expect the government to do something about it, or at least we would hope so. Uh, perhaps post-Katrina we would be a little bit less optimistic. But in any case, government was in no position to help uh, with the disasters of the 14th century. In the first place, kings did not think of it necessarily as their responsibility. A king's primary jobs were to defend the realm, and to produce an heir. Looking after plague victims was not part of the king's resume. But in any case, even if kings had the inclination, they would have lacked the machinery to do so. If you think about the difficulty we have in dealing with disaster, even today with all of our modern technology, imagine trying to deal with it in the 14th century. And finally, there is the fact that the 14th century, for whatever reason, produced a, an unusually lousy crop of rulers in Europe. They're not a very spectacular bunch. So, if you've got all these disasters happening and you can't depend on the government, where else can you possibly look? Well, the only other place is to the church. And guess what? The church is having a crisis in the 14th century as well. In fact, when a lot of people looked around at the disasters taking place and asked, why is God angry with us? The answer they came up with was the church, what they regarded as corruption uh, in the church. And certainly there were some very strange things going on in the church at this time. Of course, the church is a human institution. It is run by humans, and humans are weak and fallible, and according to Christian doctrine, sinners. So naturally you would expect some imperfections. But what happens in the 14th century goes well beyond that. At the very beginning of the 14th century, there was a huge feud between a French king and a pope that led to the papacy being uprooted from Rome, its traditional home, and moved to the French city of Avignon, a city just outside the borders of France, but culturally certainly French. Now, obviously this happened for political reasons and not for religious reasons, and therefore this was held very suspect by pretty much everybody but the French. The Italians certainly didn't like the papacy being moved out of Rome. The English, who were at war with the French, didn't like it. The Germans didn't like it because they didn't like the French, and so on. Furthermore, the papacy stayed in Avignon from 1307 all the way down to 1376. And during that entire period, every pope elected was a Frenchman. The majority of the cardinals elected were Frenchmen, and this was deeply resented in other parts of the Res Publica Christiana. Beyond that, the papacy in Avignon was cut off from many of its traditional sources of income in central Italy, and therefore it resorted to some measures to raise money which were regarded as very suspect. We'll talk about those a little bit later on when we begin working towards the Reformation. But suffice it to say for the moment 
that many people were very, very critical of the papacy during the 14th century, during its residence in Avignon. And bear in mind, all of the critics, all of the people who are complaining about this are also members of the church. This is not like there's the church here and some secular group of people over here. All of the critics are within the Roman Catholic Church itself. Well, it gets worse. In 1376, the last apparent Avignon Pope moved back to Rome and shortly thereafter died. And to make a long story short, in 1378 there was a disputed papal election in which the cardinals elected first an Italian pope and then tried to depose him and elected another French pope. The problem with this was is that neither pope would step down. Neither acknowledged the other, both denounced the other as the Antichrist, and the result is we have two people claiming to be Pope. We have the beginning of what's called the Great Papal Schism. Now, this might seem kind of funny to somebody in our day that two men would feud over the papacy in this way, but it was not funny at all to people living at the time. Remember, in order to go to heaven, you have to have all the sacraments on a regular basis. If you don't go to heaven, then that means you go to hell or you spend an awful long time in purgatory, neither of which is an attractive proposition. In order for the sacraments to work, they have to come from a legitimate priest who is ordained by a legitimate bishop, who's ordained by a legitimate archbishop, who's ordained by a legitimate pope. If you're following the wrong pope, the consequences for that can be extraordinarily serious. Needless to say, there were calls from throughout the church to do something about this. And this led to the calling in 1409 of a council, the council known as the Council of Pisa. And the idea of the Council of Pisa was to get the two popes, the French and Italian pope, to step down and to elect a unity pope. Sounds like a good idea. The trouble is, the Council of Pisa did elect a third pope, but the other two didn't step down. And now instead of having not one, not two, we have three popes, and the whole business becomes even more serious. Ultimately, it was sorted out in 1417 at the end of the Council of Constance, which was held from 1415 to 1417. But think about this. By this time, Europe has been through a century of disaster. During much of that century, the papacy was in Avignon. Then it was in schism, divided between two popes and then three popes. People have had their faith in the papacy shaken. That doesn't mean that everybody leaves the Catholic Church, but it means they begin to wonder what's going on here. Um, there also were some problems arising from the Avignon papacy uh, with some particular practices, practices which even Catholic historians will identify as corruption and superstition. One of these was the practice of simony, that is the practice of selling church offices. Another was the practice of pluralism, that is of individuals holding more than one church office at a time. And obviously, if you were in bish a bishop in two different places a hundred miles apart, you couldn't be in both places and you couldn't do both jobs. Uh, and that led to yet another problem, which is, of course, absenteeism. In addition to that, there were um, a lot of people who by this time were beginning to suspect or beginning to suggest that the church put too much reliance on certain kinds of good works that some reformers believed were not necessarily all that good. One of these was what is called the cult of the saints. That is, praying to the saints instead of directly to God, uh, venerating the saints to a degree where often the local saints seem to get more attention than Christ or God, and so on. Very closely associated with this was the veneration of relics, that is, pieces of bone that were purported to be, say, the finger of St. Paul 
or pieces of wood that were supposed to be uh, part of the cross on which Christ was crucified. There were thousands of these so-called relics, and very often these were regarded as having a sort of supernatural power associated with them, whereby if you went and prayed uh, before the relics of a saint, you might be healed of disease, you might have good fortune in marriage or in business, you might find lost treasure, all sorts of things like that. Closely associated with those two things was the practice of going on pilgrimage. That is, going to some holy site in the history of the church or to some holy location where the relics of saints were located. So, for example, people frequently went on pilgrimages to Rome. Uh, in England, for example, people went on pilgrimages to Canterbury where the bones of St. Thomas Becket were buried. This is where we get the Canterbury Tales from. And pilgrimage was a full-fledged business, kind of the late medieval equivalent of the tourist trade. But all of these suspect practices paled in significance with the sale of what were known as indulgences. Indulgences had started out innocently enough, but had become a major source of complaint by reformers by the 14th century, and indeed it is the sale of indulgences that triggered the Reformation in 1517. So in our next lecture, we will begin by looking at indulgences and at some of the problems that those create before moving on to the reform efforts and the recovery of the 15th century. Well, I hope you enjoyed Dr. Robison's lecture. Um, I'm hoping that things definitely get better throughout the centuries, especially after we learned a little bit more about the very bad 14th century during the later Middle Ages. Of course, um, you know, with our upcoming lecture, we'll talk about the new learning. We'll talk about the age of discovery. You know, with that age of discovery, Italy, I had mentioned, was the focus of the Renaissance. Italy was the, the you know, starting off point. That's where you had the famous artists like um, Da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and um, Donatello. There's so many. But when we start getting into the age of discovery, everything shifts toward the Atlantic coast because I know from your American history classes you probably have learned that England and France and Portugal and Spain were very much, even the Dutch, were leaders in exploration here in the 15th century and 16th century. Um, you know, Columbus in 1492 sailed the ocean blue, okay? So for Spain, so a lot of the money and the capital, Italy was very wealthy in the 15th century, extremely wealthy. She needed to be wealthy in order to have this renaissance, this rebirth, this recovery from the 14th century. But when the Atlantic coast starts to uh, sponsor these overseas voyages, you'll find out that our shift starts going into England and France and Portugal and Spain because these are the countries that are getting wealthier, especially Spain, um, because they discover um, with the New World gold and silver. The English tried to, but you know th they hit the wrong spot in the Americas. It wasn't like the, the Spanish did in South America and Central America. But everything, these countries on the Atlantic coast become powerful and wealthy and their monarchs will become powerful and there will be more centralized governments in Europe. And so we'll expand, of course, as we go through these lectures. And with Western Civilization 102, we will actually discuss a lot of these different countries, um, not just the ones I mentioned, but others as well, because they were all very important and integral to what happens in the whole world, not just in Europe. So I hope um, to see you for the uh, next lecture by Dr. Robison with uh, New Learning and the Age of Discovery. Until next time.